Hello and welcome back for another Sheriff of Sodium video. Today I'm going to quickly talk about medical schools and the battle for clinical training sites. This is Andrew Taylor Still. He was the founder of osteopathic medicine and his namesake medical school, A.T. Still University. He was the first school of osteopathic medicine in the country and it's long been one of the leaders in osteopathic medical education. But a few weeks ago at the A.T. Still School of Osteopathic Medicine in Arizona or ATSU SOMA, they announced some big changes in their curriculum. And those changes have importance that transcends just the Arizona campus. It really highlights a serious problem that faces medical education at large. To understand why, I gotta give you first a little bit of brief background. So ATSU SOMA, they used to have this so-called one plus three curriculum. What that meant was that students spent their first year in the classroom on the Mesa, Arizona campus, this building right here. And then for their second year, they got assigned to one of 16 community health centers where they would continue their classroom education and begin getting clinical experience starting in their second year of medical school. Here's a list of the 16 community health center locations that ATSU SOMA used to use. Um, you can see that only three of them are in Arizona. The rest of them are really spread all across the country, um, all the way from Hawaii to New York. And um, this was a good thing for the school because for one thing, it allowed ATSU SOMA to recruit students nationally. I mean, there are probably a lot of pre-meds who might not have considered going to school in the desert Southwest who gave ATSU SOMA a look because of the possibility that they could spend the majority of their medical education closer to home. And you know, for their part, these community health centers, they hoped that many of the students who were assigned there would ultimately choose to practice and, and, and work there and live there one day. But of course, these community health centers, they weren't just a recruiting tool. They were also a convenient way for the school to offload students from the main campus, which allowed them to avoid expensive infrastructure upgrades as the school grew. And back in 2019, when um, the school sought and the uh, Commission for Osteopathic College Accreditation, or COCA, approved an increase in their class size from 107 to 162 students per year, well, that put increasing pressure on the school to find enough places to put their students when they left the Mesa campus after their first year. Fissures started to develop in this system last year. ATSU SOMA reduced the number of weekly clinical hours for second year students from eight to four, but they still had to wind down their operations at four of their community health centers. Efforts to recruit new sites were unsuccessful. So a few weeks ago, ATSU SOMA's dean held a town hall meeting to announce that the school would be discontinuing their one plus three model in favor of the traditional two plus two curriculum where students spend the first two years in the main campus and then they go to outside sites for their clinical rotations. Now, obviously most medical schools use this two plus two model. So on one hand, this is really no big deal. Um, COCA is almost certainly gonna approve the change. Uh, current students and recruitment strategies are gonna adjust and business will go on as usual. But ATSU SOMA is going to have to work through a few other problems, and some of those are going to be a lot harder to overcome. Problem number one is going to be what to do with all the new second years on the main campus. Because soon there's going to be over 300 medical students on a campus that was originally designed to hold around 60 students comfortably. Now everybody's going to be taking the same classes in a three-story building that also houses the physician assistant, athletic trainer, PT, and OT educational programs. Problem number two is going to be how to repair relationships with the remaining faculty. When I watched the town hall meeting, I was struck by how deeply disappointed many faculty were when they learned about this change. You can listen for yourself. In this video, you're going to hear one of the faculty members from the community health centers, and she's going to poignantly ask why. Why would she continue to accept ATSU SOMA medical students for her clerkships rather than students from local medical schools? And Dr. Watts? So, um, sorry, I'm trying not to get too emotional about this. Um, I just want to say that this feels a little top down <laughs> and I don't feel like we as partner sites were included in what the challenge is and how to solve it. I think we have been, you know, part of this for a long time. We've built this from scratch. I've been here some, from the start. And I feel like going to a, two years on campus and I don't know what those other two years are gonna look like 
for us, you know, and for me personally, part of providing those rotations is that we have that opportunity to get to know those students during second year. We have an opportunity to see where they're going to match, where they're going to fit in in our community. I don't see them much during third and fourth year. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to just be providing rotations, why would we do that with SOMA instead of with just one of our local schools? First of all, I got to say, the kind of faculty member who cares so deeply about having longitudinal relationships with medical students is exactly the kind of faculty member that you don't want to lose. But her point's valid. I mean, these community health centers, they're located in states like Ohio, Illinois, California, New York, states that are rife with other medical schools. The faculty have other options. And that leads into problem three, which is the biggie. And that's why I'm making a video about this, because this isn't really about one medical school. The problem that ATSU is having is a problem that many medical schools face. And that is, how can they maintain enough clinical training sites for their students in the future? Now, for some medical schools, this is not an issue. And when I say some medical schools, uh, let me tell you what I mean. I mean, if you looked at a list of LCME accredited MD schools from 30 years ago, uh, that list of schools, uh, the, the old MD schools, this is not really an issue because those schools grew up organically with a, uh, an academic medical center attached to the school. And that academic medical center takes care of all the rotations that the students might need. But many newer MD schools and nearly all the DO schools, they lack those natural affiliations. And instead, they're forced to develop these contractual relationships with far-flung training sites. Here's a map of the ATSU training sites. I mean, it looks like buckshot scattered across a map of the United States. Acquiring and maintaining these kind of clinical sites has become a very high stakes game of risk for medical schools and their deans. And honestly, the single most telling moment in that ATSU SOMA town hall, it came when the dean got asked about the third year rotations. Her response was uh, less than confident. Take a listen for yourself. Yes, Mark. So, <clears throat> do we have the CHC capacity to do the third year? So we're going to be continuing to look for the third and fourth year clinical uh, rotations uh, availability for uh, students. And so um, we, I've got my pants full working on that right now for the, uh, for the current second years uh, that are here on the Mesa campus as well as going forward. So it is still a challenge, Mark. So it's not just the second year is a challenge because yeah. it's really all of them. Yes. Um, I, Make no mistake, the fight for clinical training sites is going to be the major battleground for medical school competition for the foreseeable future. The deans already know this. Back in 2019, the AMC surveyed MD school deans and asked, how many of you guys are, are concerned about the number of clinical training sites that you have? 84% answered affirmatively. How many are concerned about the supply of qualified specialty preceptors? 71% said yes. How many of you concerned about competition from DO granting schools for clinical training sites? Two thirds, 67% said yes. And it's not just in one specialty. The bar chart here shows the specialties that were most frequently cited as having difficulty finding clinical training sites. OBGYN tops the list at 51%, pediatrics 49%, but even family medicine and psychiatry, 46% and 41%. What this all means depends on where you're standing. If you're a doctor who's getting tired of clinical medicine and you're looking for a way to exit into administration and maybe you're, you've been active in your professional society and you know a lot of people and you like shaking hands and riding the circuit and making people offers they can't refuse, well, brother, I got a job for you in the dean's office. Um, because if you have a skill in establishing and maintaining these clinical training sites, then you're going to have a very valuable commodity in the market in the years to come, and you need to appreciate that and leverage it for all it's worth. On the other hand, if you're a pre-med and you're looking at medical schools and you're in the fortunate position of entertaining multiple uh, admissions offers to different medical schools, you know, you're going to be tempted to 
see what US News and World Report has to say about what's the best school for you, or maybe go to Student Doctor Network. And for a variety of reasons, I would urge you not to do those things. But instead, I think you need to look very closely at where the schools send their, their rotating students, because your path will be made much easier uh, or much more difficult if you go to a school that has a well-worn pathway into all the subspecialties and well-established rotations, or if you're going to a school where those things are much less assured and you may have to do a lot of that legwork yourself. If you're a current medical student, this is going to impact you too, um, and not just in the way that you see with your rotations, because you know MD schools and DO schools, as they compete for training sites, they're not just competing with each other. They're also competing with Caribbean medical schools, NP and PA schools, and, and many of those groups will pay handsomely for access to rotations. And to whatever extent schools of any type start bidding up the price for clinical sites and preceptors, that bill is going to get passed on to you. It's, it's your tuition that's going to foot the bill. But from the standpoint of society, there's a bigger problem here still, and that's really why I made this video. That's what I want to talk about, and that's the cheapening of medical education. Because when clinical sites become a seller's market, a buyer can't afford to be too choosy. Site and preceptor quality, they become less important than just having some place to send your students. And, and worse, any school that becomes too much of a stickler about transforming a, a fragmented shadowing experience into something that's more educationally meaningful and rigorous, well, they're probably just going to lose that site to a less nitpicky competitor. There's going to be a race to the bottom, down to the very bare minimum clinical experience that accrediting agencies will permit. And folks, you can't say I didn't warn you. Back in 2021, I got to speak to a group of osteopathic medical school deans on the biggest threats facing osteopathic medicine. And I highlighted how this competition for clinical training sites, coupled with rapid medical school expansion, was among the most serious threats because it cheapens the, the educational product that you're providing. And in a world where there's an increasing number of non-physician providers and you can get your health care on Amazon now, I don't think that's a wise strategy. If you missed my talk to the deans, I'll link to it in the notes below. Thanks for listening.